to God. That's our Savior, Jesus. reading coming from Mark's Gospel chapter 2 verses 23 through 28. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields and as they made their way his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Together, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Heavenly Father, I come to the throne of grace, seeking grace to help in this time of need. 
I know that preaching is only done in the power of the Spirit. I pray for His feeling. I pray that your word will dwell in me richly. Enable me to think your word, to speak your word, to even be emotionally moved by your word. Enable me to preach. So that your people can hear this not as the word of a man, but as it is the truth, the word of the living God. So I pray that you would open their hearts, illumine their minds, enable them to see and understand. It's Jesus preaching to me. It's Jesus directing my heart. It's Jesus rebuking and convincing me. Enable them to hear Christ. Some perhaps for the first time hearing him and being saved. Others of us, we are in desperate need of being sanctified through the truth. Answer the prayer of your son who prayed, sanctified them through the truth. Your word is truth. I echo that prayer right now for us all. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to take the subject from the last verse of this text, verse 28. Lord of the Sabbath, Lord of the Sabbath. For those who have been here, we, we were in the midst of studying Five controversy, key controversy stories in the first act of Mark's gospel. The first part, we've seen Jesus' amazing authority in the beginning of opposition with these religious leaders. We've been looking at these, uh, at five controversy, controversy stories, and now we come to the, actually the last of these two. The last two. And it's about the Sabbath. Sabbath violations. One that we're looking at today is about picking grain on the Sabbath. The other that we'll look at it's about Jesus healing on the Sabbath. Right. Several times in this chapter, Jesus has offended the religious Jews. Yeah. He has not broken the law of the Lord, but he has violated the, the traditions of men. Mm -hmm. All right. They are upset with Jesus. Because he refuses to do things they say people ought to do. Amen. We've already seen them get upset because Jesus had the audacity to eat a meal in a sinner's home surrounded by sinners. Yes, sir. Verses 15 and 16. So there's the scandal over sinners. Then we saw their anger over the Lord's refusal to observe rituals and rules the Jewish leaders commanded all Jews to follow. 
So there's the scandal over fasting. In this passage, we're confronted, confronted with another scandal. Now for the Jews, this would be no ordinary scandal here. Why do I say that? Because this scandal would create such anger and hatred towards Jesus that the Jews would begin, according to Mark 3, 6, plotting and desiring to kill him. Mm -hmm. This one's too much. Mm -hmm. In this passage in our text today, we're, we're looking at this scandal over the Sabbath. <laughs> in verses 23 through 28, we're introduced to another of his titles. Lord of the Sabbath. It came from his own lips. It underscores his sovereign divine authority while again setting him in direct conflict with the hypocritical religious leaders of Judaism. Conflict with Jesus was inevitable. That's why you always see it with the religious leaders. Why was it inevitable? Because Jesus embodied the truth. Remember, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. He embodied the truth, but they represented a system of superficial pretense and false religion. So hypocrisy, false religion will always clash with the truth. Light cannot have fellowship with darkness. And what Christ's words did, uh, Christ's words actually illuminated their darkness. All of this dead traditionalism that characterized these zealous, zealous defenders of their false doctrine. And Jesus doesn't mince words. He exposes them for who they really are. If you read Matthew 7, 15 through 20, Matthew 15, verse 14, Matthew 23, verse 15, to mention a few, he exposed them as spiritually blind leaders or false teachers who turn their disciples into sons of hell. That's what Jesus said. Put it in the same language. That's what he said. Jesus is very dogmatic. His dogmatic uh, declarations leaves no room for ambiguity. Uh, would his hear hearers remain trapped as slaves in a system of extra biblical rules and regulations, or would they desire to be set free by the gospel of grace through faith in Christ alone? Amen. Stay in slavery, be set free. Amen. Let's look at Jesus today, who is Lord. Of the Sabbath. Or Sabbath, his name. Age to age the same. Mm -hmm. He shall win the battle. Yeah. <laughs> Let's look in verses 23 and 24. Let's look at Jesus and the irritation. Jesus and the irritation. Notice first in verse 23 the conduct of the disciples. The conduct. One Sabbath, he, Christ, was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, Christ and his disciples, as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. What's wrong with that? 
This account is also in Luke and Matthew as well, but Luke says in Luke 6 and 1 that they were rubbing them in their hands and eating the grain. Mm, hold that, okay? The crop being grown in these particular fields was probably wheat or barley. Uh, in Israel, grain ripens from April to August. So this took place around spring or early summer. Probably around May or June. Now, in the ancient world, it was normal it was normal. They didn't have paved roads like we have, okay? So it was normal for pathways to crisscross fields. So travelers would traverse through crops routinely. That's normal. Roads were very scarce, especially in rural places. So travel usually took place on wide paths that stretched from one town to the next passing through fields. So, as they journeyed on their way, uh, people uh, would walk alongside the crops that, that would line both sides of the path. Now, cutting through someone's field and picking a little grain was not against the law of God was not, was not against the law of God. You need to hold that for the next verse. In fact, it was one of the ways that God provided for his people. Let me read it to you. Jot it down, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25. Uh, he says, if you go into your neighbor, neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. In other words, you can't go through and start cutting the grain. If you want to, if you want to break off a few pieces, eat it, and and, and 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 have a snack. That's not a problem at all. That's my provision to you for you. And when he says your neighbor's grain, the neighbors have to acknowledge, and you need to acknowledge that uh, ultimately all things belong to God. So it's all my provision, and I distribute it the way I desire. All right. So, it's clear from that one verse that Jesus and his disciples were not violating the law of God. If they're not violating the law of God, guess what? They're not in sin. They're not doing anything wrong. Now, saints, we don't have to listen to the accusations of others when we know biblically we're in the will of God. Yeah. Right? Amen. They're in the will of God. You know they're in the will of God because they're disciples of Christ and they're being led by Him. Yes. Right. Yes. If it wasn't the will of God, Jesus would have said, oh, don't do that. Yes. Don't touch that. Yes. Yes, sir. But Messiah didn't say that. Yes, didn't say that. No one has a problem but legalists. Hmm. Wish I had somebody in here with me. So, we see the conduct of the, uh, of the disciples. Uh, let's just make sure our conduct lines up with the Word of God. Right? What we're doing lines up with Scripture. The disciples are following Christ. Make sure you're following Christ. Make sure you recognize and acknowledge and submit to his presence, thus submitting to his word as authoritative over your life in terms of what you can do and what you cannot do. If you're good there, 
Don't worry about the legalists. Secondly, we see the criticism of the disciples. We see their conduct. Is there anything wrong with their conduct? We know they were growing in grace. We, we know they were st still being sanctified. They had a lot of growing to, to do. But right now, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. According to the word of God. But we see the criticism of, of the disciples. Verse 24. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? That's a question of accusation. We're saying, we're saying is actually in the imperfect tense in the Greek, and it means that they were continually saying, objecting, turning to the disciples, turning to Jesus continually. It wasn't that they just raised the question one time. They were continually saying this. What are they doing? Look, 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 look. Right? They wanted to draw attention to Jesus and the disciples. That's why you see the word look or behold. You know, I, I was reading this and probably not you, but you know, a little light went off, uh, came on. Like, are they following you? Well, for them to see him going through the grave field with his disciples and see exactly what they're doing, they have to be following him. I might hurt you right here, okay? But here's the mindset of the legalists. If you're, if you are, if you're someone that is always trying to catch somebody doing something wrong, if you're trying to watch people to see what they will do or, 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 or how they will respond, you need to repent now because you are a legalist. God never called me or you to test anybody's faith. That's it. When you, when you start testing faith, you're in the wrong position. Nobody does that but God. Right? God tests our faith, doesn't he? Genesis 22. What is, what is he doing with Abraham? He's testing him. Right? And God doesn't test for information. God tests to let us see where we are, and it's for growth and sanctification. And since you have no power to make anyone grow in sanctification, Stop pointing to what people are trying or, or doing, pointing fingers at people. God doesn't tell us to do that. You are identifying with the wrong group in here. Right? Have I got any warriors? Right? See, you see, the legalists is always pointing away from themselves to others. They never point this way, but they, they're constantly pointing that way, north, south, east, or west. See. So they say, look, 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 look at Jesus, look at his disciples, look, 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 behold. Focus the attention on them. They are doing, watch this, what is not lawful on the Sabbath. Yeah. Now we need to examine their accusation, their criticism. They're doing what is forbidden, they're doing what is illegal, they're doing what is against the law of God. They're doing something that ought not to be done. Now, I need you to understand, this is a very, very serious accusation. It doesn't seem seri serious to all, us because uh, of the culture that we're in, but uh, the culture that they're in, this is a very serious accusation. Because keeping the Sabbath was basic to biblical godliness. So to break the Sabbath was to rebel against God. So it's not them simply saying they're doing something that is not lawful. They're saying it's not lawful because it, it is against God. So they're saying Jesus is allowing his disciples to rebel against 
against God. So don't believe him when he says he's the Messiah. Messiah would never do that. They're trying to discredit Jesus. So they say, we got him red-handed. We caught him. Now why did the Pharisees think that picking grain was against the law? Why, why, why did they think that? Well, it's because they had built their fence around Sabbath law. So they had their own list of regulations. See, they wanted to make sure that they never violated the Sabbath. So, uh, you know, the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. They wanted to make sure. So uh, they actually specified all the different ways that someone could break the Sabbath. And if you broke their rules, you broke the law of God. According to the Mishnah, that's extra biblical material uh, developed <laughs> by the legalists, no fewer than 39 different kinds of work were forbidden on the Sabbath. Now the work, some of the work that's forbidden according to them, not according to God, but, you know, they want to make sure that they remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, so that they added their rules to it. According to them, reaping, threshing, winnowing, and preparing food was against the law of God. And they were right. But not right here. Here's how they interpret what the disciples were doing. When the disciples picked some heads of ground, the Pharisees said, they're reaping. Now we just read, you couldn't start cutting grain, but you could pick some. Right? When they rubbed their hands together to separate the wheat from the chaff, they're threshing. That's what they're saying. When they started to eat the grain, they were guilty of preparing food on the Sabbath. So with every mouthful, they violated the law of God according to the Pharisees in at least four different ways. <laughs> they violated our rules. I knew we would catch them. Just a matter of time. We got them now. This is a warning to us. You can't regulate somebody else's life by your rules. Right? You can't regulate somebody else's life by your rules. It may be a discipline for you to rise up at 3 a.m. in the morning and start calling on the name of the Lord. You can't regulate somebody else's life and say, if they're not getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning, they must not be Christian. You can't do that. I'm telling you, listen. It's been put to me this way. Well, uh, I, I get that from Jesus. He, he rose early. Now, was Jesus teaching us that we had to get up at a certain time when we pray? I heard Jesus say, when you pray. Right? He said, don't be like the hypocrites. When you pray. So, we can argue this, that Jesus expects uh, his disciples to pray. But he didn't put times on our prayer. You can't regulate somebody else's life by how you have organized and structured yours? Right? Do I have any warnings? Listen, the word of God is sufficient. I believe in the sufficiency of Holy Scripture. The word of God is sufficient. We need the same thing that the prophet said, thus says the Lord. The word of God is sufficient for, for all of our lives, right? We want our lives.
I submitted to, regulated by, controlled by the word of God, not the rules of people. The disciples are being controlled right here by the word of God as they follow the, the, the sovereign Lord, Jesus Christ. They're doing nothing wrong, but the legalists want them to be controlled by their rules. So therefore, you have criticism. And before I go further, when you walk by the rule of the word, you will get criticism right here. You'll get it. You don't have to go out there. You'll get it right here. Irritation. Jesus in the irritation. Conduct fine. If we just look at the Bible. Look at the Bible. Keep looking at the Bible. I've been preaching it since 1987 and I'm still learning it. I'm still learning it. <laughs> Verses 25 and 26, we see Jesus in the illustration. We see Jesus in the irritation, conduct of the disciples. Nothing wrong with what they're doing, but they're being criticized by the legalists because the legalists want them to conform to what they want them to do. So they're following them around, mm. wanting to catch them. Mm. Jesus in the illustration. I want you to notice in verse 25, the Lord's confrontation. The Lord's confrontation. And he said to them, have you never read it? Stop right there. expects a positive answer because Jesus knows that the Pharisees are familiar with the incident to which he's about to refer. He knows that. He says, have you not read? The, the question suggests an ironic criticism of your or their supposed knowledge of scripture. Have you not read is actually a rebuke. You Pharisees, you know your traditions. You know your rules, you know your regulations, you know your 39 principal works, each divided into six minor categories, 234 categories in total. And, and, and you, you know all the activities that you put in place that are to be prohibited on the Sabbath day. You Pharisees, y'all excel in, ex in reciting all of your prohibitions. Uh, religion for you consists of doing everything that's written down in your books, but have you ever read the book? I want to say to you in a simple way, I want to challenge you. Yes. Have you ever read the Bible? Yes. Why not? You've been to school and some of you to college, you read Shakespeare, you read some of the other textbooks, you read some of your little favorite books that comes out, you read some of the novels that you like that you got off Amazon.com, but have you ever read the book? You ever read the scriptures? You think you know about Christianity? Have you read the Bible? See, if you, if you haven't read the Bible, you don't know. But, and if you haven't read the Bible, you're not growing in your understanding of the scriptures. And therefore, you're not growing as a Christian if you've never read the Bible. You know how to mean deeper than read. Study. Meditate upon. Let it dwell in you richly. No harm intended. But we're living in very ignorant times. Ignorant, in, ignorance in the pulpit to the pews. Have you ever read the Bible? You make sure your children have all their reading assignments to do. What about this one? Make sure they get all of their, of their homework. Do you ever ask, say to them about this one? You want them to excel academically? Do you want them to excel at life? I believe that, right? Have you read? Maybe you think, well, I'm in a Bible believing church. I don't need to read. Get real.
We see the Lord's confrontation. Have you read? It's a simple rebuke. Have you read? Is this your book? We see secondly the Lord's clarification. See, Jesus knew they had read, but they think they're so smart. They don't even know how to apply properly what God said concerning the Sabbath. So Jesus says, I have read it. And I'm going to give you an illustration out of the Word of God. Because the best way, the best illustrations right. really come from the Bible. It's not, it doesn't mean you can't use, I, I'll probably use one at the end of the sermon. <laughs> but uh, the Word of God. Look at the Lord's clarification. Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus basically says here, I'm going to use the word of God to shed some light on your accusation. He could have done a lot of things. He could have said a lot of things. He could have just said, look here, I'm Jesus. That's right. They're picking grain. I didn't say they couldn't pick it. So, poof, be gone. Aren't you glad I'm not Jesus? Because I would have said that. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm a sorry. I, I, I ain't trying to explain nothing. <laughs> then I want to have this illuminating passage right here. <laughs> have you ever read 1 Samuel 21? Yeah, that's what it's referring to. You know, it records what King David did when he, when he and his companions were extremely hungry. Let me just give you what's going on in 1 Samuel, okay? Jesus knew the Old Testament, didn't he? Yes. Yes. By the way, don't ever say the Old Testament is irrelevant. That's what Jesus preached from. Yes. <laughs> he, he's referring to a story from the life of David. Now here's what's going on. In those days, uh, 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 God had rejected Saul. And he had anointed David to serve as Israel's faithful king. This is after David took down Goliath. This is after the chanting of the people. Saul gets all bent out of shape, right? David's not on the throne yet. Saul's not dead. Because of his raging envy in his heart, he wanted to kill David, so David had to run for his life. That's what David's doing in 1 Samuel 21. He, he, he's running, he's fleeing from the wrath of Saul. Now, they had left, David and his men had left in such haste that they didn't have time to gather much in way of provisions. So, they're running. They went to the tabernacle, tabernacle, 1 Samuel 21, where Abimelech was priest. Now, Abiathar is uh, Abimelech's son, okay? And David said to him, according to 1 Samuel 21, verse 3, Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. But Abimelech said to David, 1 Samuel 21, verse 4, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread if the young men have kept themselves from women. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, the priest is referring to the bread of presence, which was kept in the tabernacle. This is the sacred bread of the covenant. It was baked fresh every week. You know, sort of like that bread one of the newbies to break. You know? <laughs> After communion time, people are going to gonna take the rest of that bread home. <laughs> I was one of them. <laughs> this was the bread of the covenant, baked fresh every week. 
and then it was set out before the Lord on a golden table. The Lord had said that to Moses to do it that way in Leviticus 24, 5 and 6, verses 8 and 9 as well. Now here's the problem. The bread of presence was, was set apart to God. His holy priests were the only ones who were allowed to eat that bread. But David and his men were hungry. Technically, for them to eat the sacred bread was a violation of the ceremonial law that governed the worship of the tabernacle. So Abimelech started thinking, he's the priest. He considered the righteousness of God. He recognized that he had a higher duty here to meet basic human need. Follow me, that's important. Mm -hmm. So the priest, 1 Samuel 21 verse 6, so the priest gave him the holy bread, but there was no bread there but the bread of presence. That's what Jesus is referring to here. This was the right thing to do. In any case, but think about who David was and what he was doing. Ooh, it's real right, isn't it? Because David was no ordinary citizen, and this is no ordinary situation. He's the Lord's anointed, and David and his men are on a mission from God. So, should I feed the Lord's anointed? Is it proper? Is it proper to take this symbol that was set aside for the priests and set aside unto God that was designed to teach Israel to revere the service of the Lord? Is it proper that this should be used to serve the needs of the Lord's anointed? If I serve the Lord's anointed's needs, then I need to serve his servants who are also on a mission from God. Okay, Jesus, so why are you telling us this story? Because that's not what's going on with the Pharisee, with the disciples of Jesus. Look at Jesus. See, Jesus' argument is Abimelech did what was right. Jesus' argument is that Abimelech actually applied the spirit of the law and not, didn't stick to the letter. You don't hear me, do you? So he's arguing from a case, a harder case, to an easier one. Follow his logic. Well, if it's proper for David's men to eat the bread of presence as holy as it was, isn't it all the more appropriate for the disciples to pick a little grain on the Sabbath? If it's, pro if it's proper in the harder case, isn't it? Right? If it was proper to violate a ceremonial law when the Lord's anointed was on the Lord's business on the Sabbath, then surely the Lord's anointed, who is Jesus, Messiah, means anointed. The Lord's anointed, who is Jesus, Messiah, means the anointed one. The Lord's anointed, who is Jesus, Messiah, means the anointed one. Jesus and his followers, isn't it proper for them to break a man-made rule? When they're doing the Lord's business? Amen. David, David, Abimelech, Abimelech violated the ceremonial law, but he's applying the spirit of the law. So in essence, he did nothing wrong. Jesus says, we're not, there's no ceremonial law or anything at issue here. It's just your rules. Amen. So watch this. If you're going to say, I'm wrong, then you have to say, God was wrong in allowing that to happen. Abimelech was wrong. <laughs> right? We're not violating any law, just your rules. We're in the service of the Lord. We're on a holy mission. We have a physical need. If it's permissible for David, Shouldn't it be permissible for me, my disciples? They're serving the Son of God on the Sabbath. <laughs> mm. 
You know, they're so strict that they use the Sabbath not to show mercy, but to put a burden on people. Love for people, no matter what day it is, is a love for God. You love God, you love people. Right? So Jesus, who's masterful with illustrations, he gives his masterful illustration. You notice, allow me to use bad English, they ain't saying nothing. I don't hear you guys. What's going on? Why, why didn't you answer that? Why didn't, why didn't you come back with some more Bible? <laughs> they don't know any. <laughs> They're like, oh my goodness, it's true. <laughs> Lastly, in verse 27 and 28, I'll actually finish the section today. Jesus and the illumination. I love this. See, Jesus doesn't leave it right there. He doesn't leave it right there and say, here's an illustration, we're doing nothing wrong. Jesus says, no, I'm going to take and apply what I just illustrated to you so that you can have a proper understanding of the Sabbath. Jesus in the illumination, verse 27, we see the reason for the Sabbath. How does Jesus know the reason for the Sabbath? Act like he was there or something. Amen. And he said to them, the Pharisees, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath, God's rest, was meant to benefit and strengthen God's people. It's a gift from God. Right? It's a gift from God. And so it was designed to serve mankind, not to be the master over mankind. Sabbath observance is not an end in itself. Human beings do not exist to serve the Sabbath law. Instead, Sabbath law exists to serve human needs. That's the greater principle. Jesus is still in the Old Testament, you know that? Don't take this wrongly, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Notice how Jesus knows what he's talking about. Oh, yes. Watch this. Jot it down. Exodus 28 through 11. Just notice how our Lord nails it. Exodus 28 through 11 reads, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, the male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, for in six, four, 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 in six days, four, verse 11 says four, because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. That's the law of the Sabbath, one full day of rest in seven. Now notice some things about what Moses says. First of all, the law was fundam fun fundamental. Why do I say that in verse 11? It goes back to the foundation of the world. Right? It says for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and rested on the seventh, so it's fundamental. It goes back to the foundation of the world. Secondly, it was also very beneficial. God gave his people the Sabbath for their own good so they would get rest that they needed. They were able to flourish in the activities of life. So it's beneficial. Thirdly, it's relational. It helped people to establish a bond of fellowship between God and his people. They're made in his image and therefore there was this weekly rhythm what was patterned after his work and rest in the creation work in the beginning. So, to keep the Sabbath then was to be like God. Y'all don't hear me. So it was at the heart of what it meant to be godly. I'm not seven day, I'm just preaching the Bible. Right? Follow me, I'm going somewhere. So Jesus knows what he's talking about, right? He's exact, he, 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 it is a summary of what God 
said to Moses. See, for Israel, the Sabbath, which was Saturday, was the best day of the week. It's the day that they got to worship and rest in the goodness of God. It's the day that they got to cease from the labor and toil for the work day week. It was also a day that they looked forward to the full, final, and full salvation that would be provided in Christ alone. And when, when, when Israel really had a clear vision, they understood when they had a clear vision. They understood that when they came together on that Sabbath day, that they were looking forward in anticipation of the age of the Messiah. Right? Well, the Messiah has come. Has he? Can't you find rest in him? Have I got any war you see? So Jesus is the reason for the Sabbath. <laughs> the Sabbath is beneficial. The Sabbath is fundamental. The Sabbath is relational. Right? The, pure, the, the Puritans call Sunday the market day of the soul. How much do we look forward to? Amen. You know where you found Jesus on, on the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. In the synagogue. Mm -hmm. That's where you found him. As messed up as it was. Mm -hmm. That's why he would teach. <laughs> and preach. But then in verse 28, finally, we see the reality of the Sabbath. He said, so, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Uh-oh. Jesus, you know Mark chapter 3 coming after he said that. That's a problem right there. Son of Man, that's a missing title, remember? I showed you before that uh, it echoes the Old Testament prophecy of Daniel 9, 7, excuse me, 9 through 14. So when Jesus uses this title, we know that he's testifying to his true humanity, but he's also hinting at his coming glory. He's the first man in the new humanity, but he's also clearly God. Why do we say that? Because he says he's Lord even of the Sabbath. And to be Lord of the Sabbath, what are you talking about, Jesus? Well, according to Genesis 2, 1 through 3, only God is Lord of the Sabbath. Only God. On the seventh day, God rested. Six days, he had done the work of creation, forming the universe and all of his vast splendor, making the world to be our home. But then God rested, and he rested. He sanctified the day to be holy, day of rest for his people. God rested. Yes. Jesus, are you saying what I think you're saying? He's Lord of the Sabbath because he's God. And here's something I find strange. Here's something I find strange. Uh, about this verse. Now, I really don't find it strange, but I find it strange with some of my buddies that want to eliminate the fourth commandment. Come on there. I find, here's something I find strange. The Christians, they have the impression that in this passage, Jesus will say, the Sabbath no longer matter. Come on, bring it out, So Lord, the Sabbath can do whatever you want and whatever you want to do. He wanted to eliminate today, he can eliminate today, and essentially that's what Jesus is doing here. The truth is exactly the opposite, church. He says he's Lord of the Sabbath, making a strong claim to his deity. But he's also pointing to the abiding significance of the fourth commandment. You don't hear me, do you? Remember, the Sabbath commandment came from God. It's not a human invention. It's a divine institution. Right? God 
established it the week the world was made. He reiterated when he gave his law to Moses. The Sabbath came from God. He patterned it after his work in creation and revealed it on the Mount Sinai in, in glorious thunder. Jesus is our Lord of the Sabbath. He is the creator and he is the lawgiver. I don't see him eliminating anything here. He's supreme over the Sabbath. Right? So, Sabbath is great, but Jesus is greater, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. You know he Lord, he's Lord over the Sabbath, right? I don't see him abolishing anything here. And you're going to go home and you're going to read John, John MacArthur or something. You're going to say, well, MacArthur says, well, I'm talking about what Jesus said. And you all know I love me some MacArthur. I'm talking about what Jesus said. I don't see that. We, we, we want to get carried away and think, well, it's simply a Jewish ordinance and it was abolished and done away with by Christ. But there's not a single passage in the Gospels that prove that. Not one. Every time you find Jesus speaking about it, he speaks against the false views of it that were taught by the Pharisees, but he does not speak against the day itself. Jesus kept the Sabbath. Do I have any warriors here? I mean, if, if an architect comes to repair a building and to restore it to its proper use, he doesn't destroy it, he prepares it. He, he preserves it, right? So, Pastor, are you saying that Jesus wants this day of rest on Saturday? No, I'm not saying that. But I am saying this. I believe the day has changed, but the principle mm -hmm. is unchanged. Amen. I'm not attaching all of the ceremonial laws, okay? But I believe the principle of honoring the Lord and the, and the people of God coming together is unchanged. I mean, the, I mean, the early Christians worship on the first day of the week, Acts 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. You know why they worship on the first day of the week? Because Jesus got up on the first day of the week. Right? John 20, verse 19. Jesus got up on the first day of the week. And you know what John called it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10? John called it the Lord's Day. Right? Amen. The Old Testament, the Old Testament Sabbath was on the last day of the week, but they were looking forward in anticipation to the Messiah coming, where the Messiah has come, yes. in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. So he's the fulfillment of the Sabbath, and we've already begun to enter into his rest, and we began the first day of the week by acknowledging Jesus is Lord of my life. We come together and we declare Jesus is Lord of our life. We come together and we declare Jesus is Lord of our lives. Amen. 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 Right? Amen. But nevertheless, we come together in anticipation. If we believe this, it would we change how we come together, period, how we live. Our weekly Sabbath rest in Christ points to the end of history. Amen. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. Do you believe right now our coming together right. points to the end of history? Yes. Yes. It points to the final consummation of Christ bringing all things together, all of, all of his promises, all of his promises that are yes and amen in Christ, all the promises of God brought together in, 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 in fulfillment, were perfected in holiness, and the body of Christ from every tribe, kindred, and nation will come together. Guess for what? It's a, right now, it's a snapshot. I tell you 
this often. It's a sleep preview. Yes. Yes. What if you get up next Sunday morning and says, well, I'm on, on my way to a uh, sleep preview. Yes. <laughs> of what could happen as early as this evening. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right? Because when Christ comes together, he's going to come together and he's going to have that diversity in the church that he wants. He's going to have everybody coming together, all nations, kindred, tribes. Nobody's going to be looking at anybody funny. How should we treat one another when we come together? Amen. If, it, if, it's, if it's speaking to a future anticipation, y'all don't hear me. We get to rest on this day. Right? I believe there ought to be special services on this day that are available to people. I believe the hospitals ought to be open. I believe, uh, you know, I believe any type of emergency needs that we have should be open, but I, but, but I do not believe, I do not believe, I do not believe we need to be running all over town, shopping, going down, doing all this stuff on the Lord's Day. Yeah. Yeah. We need to find some rest. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You got Monday through Saturday to do that. Can't you contemplate and meditate on God for one day? Amen. I'm so tired, I'm so tired. When you keep running, God says, I've got the pattern set for you. I, I set it up for you to get some rest. I set it up for you. You start the week off. You can make it because I've given pastors to the church to equip the church for the work of the ministry. I've given pastors to the church to, to preach expositionally through the word of God. And I strengthen you and I sanctify you through that word. And then you go home and you take it all out with mess. Hey, glory. How many sermons have you meditated on Sunday afternoon? Oh, I don't know. Learn to rest. Right? Hebrews 4, 9 and 10 so, says, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Who, who, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as did, God did from his. We need to be trying to work our way. No spiritual labor to try to work your way. You find the rest in the finished work of Christ. The Lord's day is for worship. Right? The Lord's day is for worship. The Lord's day is for worship. It's for worship with the people of God coming together. It's for fellowship. It's for worship. Right? Well, let's stop having our children have all these athletic affairs on Sunday. Amen. Right? Yes, sir. Stand up the truth. They can't come to church because they're playing the AAU. Oh, you all don't hear me now, do you? Well, when their hearts talk, their basketball skills won't help. When their mind needs regulating, the basketball skills won't help. Them. Have I got any warriors? When they're facing t temptation, their basketball skills won't help them. They need to hear from God. They need to come together with the saints on Sunday. And you need to be bringing them. Don't make light what we do here. Right? Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Shouldn't he be honored on this day? As well as every day. Right? Shouldn't we start the week out with the people of God coming together to honor and to worship and to declare his lordship over all of our lives and submitting to his word as it is given to us through the man of God? Shouldn't, shouldn't that happen? Something happens on Monday. So well, I'm going to prepare for Monday. Yes, you are. He prepared you on Sunday. You just didn't listen to him. Anyway, you were prepared. 
So, who's the Lord of the Sabbath? Jesus. Jesus. I don't see him eliminating anything here. The days change, but the principles don't change. Amen. Right? Amen. You know, I used to work for the public defender's office. I, I hate it sometimes when we have death penalty cases. So I worked a few of them, death penalty cases. What I hated most about them was sometimes the judge wanted to go through the weekend with court because I would have to be in court. And I remember one particular case, the judge had decided we have court on Sunday morning. I wasn't mean, I wasn't obnoxious or anything like that. I just told my head investigator, I said, I will not be there if he has court on Sunday mornings. He said, but the judge is saying you have to have, if you have court, you know, if you have court, you gotta be there. I said, I will not be there. Whatever that means, I won't be there. And we have court on Sunday mornings. Because Sunday morning is not court day to me. The judge and the jury and everybody else, the DA and the PD ought to be able to figure this out Monday through Saturday. I said, I'll come on Saturday. But I'm not coming on Sunday. Take a stand. It's the Lord's Day. It's the Lord's Day. You know what I'm going to be on Sunday? So I'm going to be in the Lord's house with the Lord's people. It's his day. If he made losing the job, then I would have just lost him. The Lord would have given me another one. Right? Because my trust was in him anyway. This is, I'll leave you. That's a story told of a lady. She's married to this guy. Let's call him. Let's call him Jeff for a time being, okay? He, he's a very strong, rules-oriented man. He had a list for his wife every single day. She got so frustrated living with Jeff, mm. even though Jeff was a good man. And it wasn't that he was asking her to do wrong things, it was just that she was tense because she had always, she had to always wonder if she was living up to the standard that Jeff had established in the relationship. Mm. One day, Jeff died. One day Jeff died, but she had become so used to living under the tutelage of Jeff that she didn't know how to cut him loose. So she had Jeff and mom and, and brought her home. She had lived so long with him, she didn't know how to live without him. So the dead Jeff, she sat, they sat him in a chair in the living room and she would ask the dead Jeff throughout the day whether it was okay or not to do this or that, to go here or there. She asked the dead Jeff that. One day this lady went on vacation in Europe. Well, while she was in Europe, she met this guy named Alex. Alex loved her. Alex drew out, drew out her emotions that had long since died with Jeff. Alex he, Alice inspired her. He, Alice brought joy to her. She, she, she noticed that, 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 that she would do all the same stuff for Alex that she had done for Jeff, but it was without the demands. The relationship was so strong. She did things for Alex because she wanted to, not because there was a list saying she had to. So she and Alex decided to get married. They decided they wouldn't live in Europe, they, 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 they would live in the U.S., so she brought Alex back to her house. Well, when Alex walked through the door, uh, his mouth dropped because she introduced Alex to Jeff. She, she, she brought her new love into her old house. And she said, now Alex, I love you. But you got to understand, I lived with Jeff so long until I got to keep him nearby. Well, Alex let her know in no uncertain terms. He said, now baby, you can't have a dead man named Jeff 
and a living lover named Alex. She told he, he told his new bride that she either had to give up her living lover or stay with old dead Jeff. You gotta either bury your old love so you can be free for your new love. Y'all can hear me. She, she, she couldn't have a dead love and a living love in the same house. Many of us been married to Jeff, haven't we? Oh, we, we've, been, we've been living on this rule-based approach to Christian life, but then one day you met Jesus. And when Jesus came in, Jesus said, go ahead and dump Jeff. Because you're with me now. And if you want to understand something about this relationship and how good it is, do you mind if I testify and tell you? The joy is unspeakable. The love is unconditional and inexpressible. The provision is exceedingly and abundant above all. You can ask a thing. The future is guaranteed and secure. And all the communication is unforgettable. Because every day, you know what he does? He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I am his own. The joy we share as we carry there, no other has ever known. You know what else says he's Lord? All of my times are in his hand. Right? Because he's Lord, if I'm walking through the grain field, I don't worry. If I'm walking beside still waters, I don't worry. If I'm walking through the valley of the shadows of death, no worry. If I need a table prepared before me right in the presence of my enemy, no worry. Because you know what? There's two guys following me as Jesus leads me. I look, I, I look in the front of me. I, I, I'm going, come on, quiet. I look in the front of me and I see the Lord Jesus. Ooh, isn't, that, isn't that awesome? But then I turn around behind me. Who is that? That's goodness and mercy. Y'all don't hear me do that. I got the Lord leading me. And I've got goodness and mercy behind me, so surely I shall dwell. I didn't hear nobody in here with me. Surely I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's Lord of the Sabbath. And we're free. Get rid of Jeff. I'm telling you, get rid of him. Get rid of him. That's right. That's right. Can't live in the same house. No, sir. No, sir. You'll never be free to love Jesus Amen. until you get rid of Jeff. If I'm talking to anybody today who has no relationship with the greatest lover in the world. That's Jesus. Amen. I didn't die for you, he did. He paid. He paid, I'm telling you. Yes, sir. He paid in full your sin debt. The Father was satisfied. He raised him on the third day. He ascended. The ascension is part of the resurrection. Don't ever forget that. He doesn't ascend. The spirit doesn't come to apply the gospel to our hearts through the preaching of the word. So we need him to ascend. So the spirit sends the spirit. Right? And he says, come to me. Yes. All of you who are laden. Trying to earn God's favor. Through your worthless labor. Yes. <laughs> Heavy labor. Yes, Jesus says, You want some Sabbath rest? Amen. Come to me. I'm not selling rest, I'll give it to you. You'll find rest, hey, glory, for your soul. 
He needs soul rest. Amen. I need some soul rest. I need my mind to rest. I need my emotions to rest. I need my will rested. All in Christ alone. He says, I'll give you rest. Amen. You're here today. What the choir sings? Bow and do holy business with the Lord. <laughs>